the smell of that stuff, you know. It's, it's alive. It's not dead. <laughs> I just enjoy watching Mother Nature working. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's intriguing. I mean, if you've never been around doing composting and then you see it change on a daily basis as you turn it, it's impressive. Most people say, well, that can't be that to this. It is. We've been farming roughly around 1,500 acres. Okay. Of uh, last year was probably the most diverse that we've ever been. And having uh, we had rye, we had peas, we had sunflowers, edible beans, soybeans, alfalfa, and wheat. So we, from a few years ago, we were just basically doing uh, soybeans and wheat. And so we have go on to, to more of a diverse farming operation, which I think is, is, is helpful in uh, management or, or to try to get your biology going, so. This is our feedlot facility, which we call Hollywood Feeders, um, here in Toronto, South Dakota. And uh, we're a permitted facility for 34.99 head of beef cattle. So in a standard monoslope type barn, the livestock are bedded with straw and, and then that combines with their manure and you have a bed pack situation. Olson Custom Farms, uh, we farm about 12,000 acres in, in Minnesota and South Dakota. So Dual County, Lincoln County, uh, Minnesota, and a little bit over in Hamlin County, South Dakota as well. Right now we farm, we're right around 2,200 acres. Soybeans, corn, sugar beets, and, and we do have wheat every, so we don't have any wheat this year. Um, we'll chop some of the corn for silage, but we tend to feed a lot of the beet pulp from the, from the factory. Um, but it's nice, again, to fit in with spreading the manure. If we we're chopping silage, we know we can spread some manure and compost, so that works out really well. So with the feedlot, we're, um, we're allowed 999 through the state. Uh, we normally run about, oh, there's probably 500 um, that we feed in there, almost all finishing. So the, the feedlot process is, is, I'll go in about every, well, right around this time, every year with the excavator and pile our piles, uh, pile our piles where the, we put our bedding, I'll pile as high as it'll go. And then we have, we have our sloped feedlot that goes into the lagoon, so all that leachate runs into the lagoon, the, the manure starts to dry out, and then after a while, normally it's, normally it's uh, mid-August, we'll start to haul that, that manure out. Um, we try to do it in about two, two and a half days. Um, that's our goal anyway. So we tend to, we'll hire a, a, a contractor to come in with one of those big trucks to haul, and then I just load them with the excavator, which works really well. Normally we have about, um, per year, we're, we have about probably 4,000 tons of manure but like this year, it's a double year. We really had a wet year last year, so we're trying to figure out what we're gonna do there. We try to plan our acres based on the crop that we're gonna go into. I like to go into corn, but we have in the past done it where we'll spread on ground that's going into sugar beets. Because um, normally that's wheat, sometimes wheat ground, so we can get it, we know we're gonna get it spread. We can spread lime, we can spread manure. So we've done that um, the last couple of years. Um, like I said before, not all of it gets turned to compost of the feedlot manure that we take out, but the stuff that we do, I'll either put close to the farm and run my windrows there, or in the past, I have gone on the edge of a field, dumped the manure, and then just turned it, you know, four or five times, and then it's right there, we're able to spread it on the ground. So as far as spreading, we've done a little bit of both. We've had custom guys come in and spread our, our compost and our manure, but um, the last few years, we bought a, our own vertical spreader, and so we've been able to um, spread with that and then have another neighbor that brings his over so but we've got a lot of material now so I think we'll probably end up doing something just to get rid of it all. We should be able to spread you know probably 500 of those acres I would imagine this year is kind of my goal that's how much we have a lot of material normally I'd only like to put on about five ton but with the material we have it might be closer to 10 maybe 15 um, I'll, I'll end up doing trials with that too, just to see the difference. But with the compost, I'd like to spread a little, being that I have enough of the product, 
I would really like to see what more, you know, a higher amount does uh, to kind of maybe offset some of that fertilizer side of it. That's one thing I really want to learn though too is, you know, can I move forward using a lot less fertilizer? Because it's hard, it's hard to move away, as I said before, from the NPK mindset. But I know, especially the P and the K, I know I can replace that with the compost through, through time. And I live here on five acres in eastern Wright County with my family, who is now just two of us because all the other, all the kids are gone now. <laughs> but we still have uh, four horses. We've got the two you can see in the background, the two big boys, and we got two little boys out in back. Clean stalls every evening before everybody comes in from being out here on the pasture or out in the dry lot. Manure goes in a wheelbarrow, wheelbarrow comes out here and we just dump it here in front of the pile. And maybe once a week or so, kind of depends on how much manure we've had. Uh, I'll take the tractor and we'll load it back up onto the pile and, and stir the pile at the same time. Well, the reason I, I started first of all is I, I'm concerned about, first of all, organic matter and second, uh, more, more so infiltration. I think we have a real problem with infiltration. And how do you remedy that? And, and I still don't have an answer for that. Uh, the other thing is that we've been losing organic matter in our soil. And, and we put in, in, most people feel we put all this residue into the ground, it's gotta go into organic matter, but most of it goes up into the air. I went to uh, Acres Conference and there was a guy there that uh, he showed the extract and he showed it up on the screen and he see all those critters moving around. And it says, you know, those are live in our soil and I think we need to get them, get them back in there again. The fertility is here. This is one of our business entities of the farm, but it was very underutilized and it just was begging for the opportunity because it's the best fertility we could have for the farm, but how are we going to get it out on to the acres? When I joined the farm as the agronomist, I quickly identified in fall of 2016 that we needed, we could do a better job with this fertility and make it kind of the hub of our fertility program. But the only way we were gonna be able to do that was to get it in a transportable uh, package, so to speak. And that's where you fall back on the idea of composting. Diversification is, is important. Um, utilizing the acres that you have, soil health, all those buzzwords, um, compost is, is at the peak of that. Yeah, it's been 15 years since I've started to do this. and. Every year is a new experience, but I really enjoy doing it and I enjoy talking about it. And I, I just think um, it's, I like to use the term, it's the right thing to do. And it's also, I think it's, it's the way things are going. I think it's, um, is we're, we're taking that, that management, that um, stewardship to the next level. And we're taking a waste product that people don't want to look at. They think it smells, they think it looks bad. And we're turning it into something that you could give your kids and it wouldn't, wouldn't, they could eat it and it wouldn't harm them. That's an amazing thing to me. So uh, for me personally, um, I think the combination is, is really a really good way to go. And I think from a, um, a sector side, from an agriculture sector, sector side, we're gonna have to start moving away from the synthetic fertilizers, from relying on that. And, and if we're about building our soil health, it's putting the, that organic matter back on the soil. Every spring I spread it out on the pasture, give the grass some nutrition and we use it for garden mulch, uh, and uh, it uh, reduces the, the volume of the manure, uh, probably by a third. It's a very inexpensive thing to do. You do have to have equipment to keep your, the compost pile turned over. I would hate to have to do this with a shovel, that's for sure. It would be a better operation here if I had started this on a concrete slab, because one of the problems is over the, over, well, we've been here for 25 years, and uh, the, the ground around the manure pile is starting to go down just because it gets caught up in the, in the bucket of the tractor once in a while when we turn the pile over. The manure pile itself as a composted stays at a fairly high temperature, but it'll only do that if you keep it turned over and keep it aerated and give the bacteria some, some oxygen to live on. Good farming, you need a mix of, of the fungal and bacteria 
and that's why I've done some more of the of the static that I will introduce the static in with the with the regular compost because most of our compost I can show you those numbers but most of the of the uh, of the compost that we build in the row like this it's too gets too hot and the fungal material doesn't survive and I'm hoping that we can once that these piles are probably getting cool enough now that that we can do the uh, the fungal material add that to the compost this is some finished compost and uh, here so this is this is what this came from and most people have a hard time visualizing well this is soil I mean but it, it's compost that it, that's gone through the process of of with the, all the microbes and everything else and and uh, and digesting it and this is the final result of that and which is very uh, impressive stuff I use straw I, I've, I've used pea straw I've used uh, soybean straw I've used corn straw and we also try to get wood chips if we possibly can this is the first time we've been using uh, a larger amount of hay because uh, we had some uh, of our alfalfa that was left over from last year. We're using that and we have in the mix that we're doing right now, it'll be 30 bales of straw on a roll with 15 bales of alfalfa. This is last year's alfalfa. So this is a really good nitrogen source to add then with your, because what kind of straw is this then? It's rye straw. Okay. From the seat of the pants. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> it's that's it's good. basically what you've got available. Yes. We normally green chop our road ditches as as another forage area. So that would be another nitrogen source. That's right. The second time through you put water on your probably a few times before you put the manure on top of it. Yep. It'll get a nice even windrow. And so do you think you'd be able to compost here without water? No, I think water is important because this stuff is so dry when you start with. So we will probably dump like three semi loads of manure into this here, okay. which would be 150,000 pounds. And is that manure coming out? Is that a bedded pack? Bed, bed, bed pack, yep. bed pack. Yep. Okay. And that'll have some hay and straw and also in there too, but yep. it should make a pretty hot mixture, I would think. And usually don't have any problem with temperature. You said that pile over there was even up to 120 already. Well, when that got turned with that moisture in there, now that'll probably by tonight or tomorrow morning, it'll be up to 140, mm -hmm. 150 degrees. And uh, that's where your biology starts working on there and, and uh, breaking down everything uh, in, in there. So that'll be a, a good material for the soil. When your compost gets down to ambient temperature, you can use it. Or another method is, I think if you put it into a, a Ziploc bag, and if it doesn't smell ammonia, you, you, you're, you're okay to spread it. You notice that this is, is this ideal place. Yes. It's, it's, you've got a slope on it. Mm -hmm. So anybody that, you, you, you can't have it in a, in, a, in a slew hole. I mean, you've got to be able to excess your, or do your turning, even though you've had rain. So that's, this here has got a nice gentle slope and it, it, it heads off over to the side. We've got the analysis of both the regular windrow composting and also the static compost from the same material coming back. So if we have 12,000 acres, we hope to apply compost to 4,000 every year. So every field will see compost hopefully once in every three years. Some people work under their state uh, regulations, uh, others work under an EPA permit. But with this facility, um, it's easier to work under the state regulations versus an EPA permit. This particular county, you had to get a special use permit. And of course, the, the neighbor's concern was, oh, you're gonna have more flies more smell because now you've brought it out out on one particular site and not land applied it but with the inoculants and the composting process within one or two turns it's not manure anymore it's compost and it's basically odor free and then we'll have two pads where all the windrows are contained so we can hold 36 
uh, windrows that are 14 feet by 160 feet long. And they're 160 feet because that's the length of our felt covers that we'll have over the windrows. The felt covers are for, for moisture management because in the composting process, the microbes want to stay at a consistent temperature and moisture. And so excess moisture messes up that process and, um, and the windrows getting too dry would also shut that process down. So if we have them all covered, we control the moisture with the compost turner and the, cart, the water cart that follows. Uh, we control and rain, snow, whatever doesn't uh, interfere with that. Or like this summer, we have a lot of hot, windy days. You would have to be adding water to your windrows like constantly. The longer you have a run, the harder it is to get water away from the windrows, even on a, de a design pad. So we shorten them up to 160s, so there'll be a diversion channel kind of right in this area where the first runs water collects and gets diverted to the containment pond. So within this site, all the water from a rain event, excess water goes to the containment pond down there. We didn't have a lot of slope to work with here, so we have to kind of create this, this, the necessary slope because most compost sites, you have to be able to work in, you know, all the time. And so it can't be a place where water accumulates. It has to drain away because excess moisture uh, doesn't lend itself well to composting. And that's why we discovered too that most large scale composting sites tend to be in more arid areas. But over here, where you have more moisture, you have to create that condition where you can work with your compost on an almost daily basis because the wind rows will demand that. This will be our loadout spot that we're standing on here to bring in trucks and uh, we'll haul it to the field. We're thinking with a live bottom truck and then we'll meet the compost or litter spreader out in the field and that'll have a conveyor so we can just back up with a live bottom so we don't need another payloader. We don't want a double handle in the field that we're spreading. We want that to be efficient. The equipment to compost really in the scope of what farm equipment costs isn't the obstacle because there's a scale of composting equipment for every size operator. It comes down to the site and what, how extensive a site do you need. We probably wouldn't be able to permit this facility had we not taken on this type of um, manure management system. They would have had to redesign something within the, the barns or how the manure is handled because under the new South Dakota permitting you can't we can't store manure for very long outside the barn, if at all, depending on what your situation is. Out here with the feedlot, when my father-in-law built the feedlot, um, it was kind of nice because he had to, to come under uh, the guidelines of the feedlot runoff. And um, so in dealing with the manure, we had a best management practice plan. And then with the composting, it fit really well into that. And, and we were able to utilize um, a lot more of that product on, uh, on a wider acre uh, basis. As you can see out here, the beets have been the biggest challenge. Um, most of the time you're dealing with either a carbon source or a nitrogen source. And what I've found is it almost goes from a carbon to a nitrogen back and forth, depending on, on the, how the beets feel. I mean, they start off really spongy, but then as they dry out, they get really hard, basically like a, a carbon source. And so finding that happy medium of, of what to do the, with the beets has been, has been a I won't say tough because it, it really isn't tough. It's just, it's, it's interesting. And it's, uh, I like the interesting side of compost too. So um, what I found with this, and, and again, that's one of the main reasons I bought my Turner is 
you know, if a guy could start off with a smaller particle size, you would be way better off. With my machine, after two times, it really breaks that stuff down. The ingredient part is the main thing. I, I have found with our manure, we use, we use straw throughout the year. So we tend to have a pretty good mixture based on just the straw that we put in with the manure in the feedlot. I don't have to add a lot. With the beets, like I say, the, the moisture level can vary so much that it's more of kind of a feel and a look for me. So I don't really have a recipe at this point. Again, um, you know, there's a few things I try to do to, to start that process a little quicker, but you know, over time it, you know, it starts to heat up even without turning it and then uh, getting that particle size down is, is kind of the main thing. So talking about mistakes and I made a lot of mistakes is, is the carbon side of it. I've, I've really come to find out and my dad has too that, you know, the manure is good, but, but you can have too much of it. You know what I mean? Um, and if you're going for a good product, you don't need a whole lot of manure. I, I consider the manure to be kind of a, a magic elixir, but um, you, can, you can get in trouble with, with it heating up too much as far as when you apply it, especially repeat customers, because they think a little is good, a lot must be better. So I've really tried to go away from just doing straight manure piles out of the feedlot. We still do it. But if I'm going for a good product, I'll basically start with my carbon source and then add the manure. Yep. Here, it's almost trying to keep the moisture out of it. Um, I deal more with, with puddling, um, which creates a challenge even with, with the equipment. You know, uh, sometimes a two-wheel drive tractor is not enough to even pull sometimes, which is kind of frustrating. But the heavier ground out here poses a challenge, but um, I've been able to get around that. Now, that's where Hankinson comes into play. I've got some some compost ground down by Hankinson, North Dakota, where it's basically blow sand and it can be raining and I can be turning. So I love making compost down there and it makes a really good product too. Well, here it was just uh, the, <laughs> the closeness to the feedlot. Um, I didn't want to have to haul it very far and we had a, a spot uh, that was close enough that, that had a, you know, a, a good enough drainage site um, that, that worked and I, and I try to move my piles around so I'm not putting it on the same spot but I also don't want to take up a lot of ground. But I've also done where we'll, we'll pile manure on the end of a field, I'll turn it and then we spread it right away which really works nice and that's a year process. The trucking cost is always something that I really take into account um, because it can get expensive but it's no different than um, you know if you're having to haul manure. I try to take into account that and, and with the compost you're hauling a lot less material too. The marketing side of it of course I want to get to the point where I can market almost all of it. Um, I'd, like, I'd love to get to the point where I have a really good product. I can find growers, especially organic guys, that, that they would really appreciate a good product that they could use. Um, and maybe even some of the conventional guys to see that, you know, the big thing is soil health right now. I don't know of a better way to build your soil than put compost other than maybe cover crops. My dad had this, this exact machine. He bought his brand new uh, about 15 years ago. I was able to find this one used and I knew I wanted to, to find the same machine if I could do that just because I knew it. It's simple and to be honest it makes a really good product. Um, it's not aggressive but once the material starts to break down it really does a good job of incorporating the material and also incorporating the oxygen and um, the biggest thing that I found and, and in most cases you would think that you would want the machine to turn really fast. When I start off I do run it fast but as time goes on those, those, mic, you know, those microorganisms do more of the work than the machine does and basically what I do with this machine is, is I'm basically just fluffing that material um, and, uh, and just trying to, um, you know, if it's reaching that temperature that I want to turn it at, that's kind of my basis for when I turn. But um, I'm, I'm not looking at being aggressive once, once it starts to break down and those piles get, get small by the, by the end of the process. So one of the downfalls of this machine is, is it doesn't quite fit a dump truck when you're dumping your material. So you're constantly in your loader sizing up your windrows and that's the only downfall that I have with this machine. So now this machine right here uh, was, I think this cost me about $15,000, which I felt was a pretty good price. Um, so, and they're, they're not easy to find, but, um, but if a guy can find one and they're, they're beginning, there's beginning to be more and with the internet, you can find, you can find them more and more. This machine new with the water is, is probably $50,000, I think. So yeah, this machine has been a big boon to our operation. 
Um, as you can see, I've got all the flails off, but I did put a couple, a couple on here just to show. Um, you can see how how big these knives are compared to the other the other machine. Now, the reason I bought this machine was is I was getting a lot more material, and I wanted to get through it quicker than I was getting through with that other machine, and I wanted to do. I wanted to, to start with a smaller particle size was the biggest thing. Okay. It just really, um, <laughs> and this thing is really aggressive. Um, it doesn't make as good a finished product and I would recommend, that's why it's nice. I, I really don't want to have two machines but it's worked out really well that I can, I can start off my piles and, and get going on them fast and handle a lot of material. I can do almost 2,500 tons an hour with this thing. Um, and then when the piles start to get smaller, I come through and, and use that other machine. Um, of course, it's, it's more expensive <laughs> and they're harder to find. And I didn't like the self-contained engine, but it was kind of just what worked at the time. So every one of those then will have, we'll have a knife. It's got 80 knives on it. Yep. It makes, you know, going through manure pot, heavy manure can cause a lot of issues with that other machine if you, if you, um, if you have a too big of a pile, this thing, I, it will go through anything. Yeah. It's, it's unbelievable. What's nice about the vertical beater is I, I've used compost spreaders in the past and I love them, but we still spread manure and you can't spread. And, and I'm not, I'm not an all or nothing guy. I mean, sometimes you just run into problems where you don't have the time and, and manure is still a great product in my mind. So we're able to, uh, to kind of kill two birds with one stone. We spread lime with it too. Um, spent lime from the beet factory so for us um, this was a no-brainer um, we probably need a couple more but <laughs> um, this works really well and the nice thing and, and what I've looked at doing is I can take these beaters off and build windrows also as a barrier to entry our, our feedlot corresponds with the compost equipment just perfectly the only excess piece of equipment I've had to buy is a, is a turner I mean, everything else I can use in the feedlot, the manure spreader, this, this has worked out really well for adding my carbon source to, to my piles. Um, and then, uh, you know, of course the, the spreader and then trucks and loaders, you know, you have those, you're, you have those already. So uh, that, that to me was, was just, was awesome when people ask about, you know, getting into, into composting. If you, if you have cattle already and are feeding or, you know, even just a rancher, you have the majority of the equipment already, which is, which is just huge because it's pretty easy to go and spend a lot of money on equipment if, if that's, you know, if you're looking to get started um, without, without that already. Oh, wow, yeah. This is basically straight manure with, you know, we mix um, corn stalks and wheat straw. Yeah, and this stuff was screened with a quarter inch screen. This is about, oh, two year old, two year old material. So this would be something I would sell to a gardener. The stuff that I would apply would have bigger chunks. I mean, this stuff, as you can see, there's chunks here, but it breaks apart, it's, oh, it's yeah, friable, it so. Um, but nothing like it. <laughs> when I start to turn my product, I do have the end user in mind of what I, I don't want to sell to a local gardener um, or a local landscaper a product that doesn't look good. And so um, I've, I've come to the conclusion that, you know, that's my machine to make a good finished product and I also want to try to screen it if possible. So I, I do have access to a screener um, and that makes a huge difference. Um, and there's a difference to compost. Most people think compost is just one big thing, but you know, um, some of that finished compost, I'll turn 15 times if I have to do it. The stuff that I put on my fields, I'll do a minimum of four. Normally it ends up being about six, seven times. It's more of an art than a science is at the end of the day. You have different conditions, it might rain and then you've got to decide you know, you might have a smell that doesn't quite smell right. I got to go add some carbon to it. So it does take, take some time, especially if you're trying to make that high quality product. Figure out what you're trying to do. We made the mistake of buying one for a skid steer right away and it was a complete waste of time. It, it made a good product. So someone on a small scale, I would say that's a great way to start. Uh, we were dealing um, with my dad's business in probably three to 4,000 tons a year. And I would say even a loader is too, is too small and it's too slow. To, to do a good job. I would recommend right away someone getting a machine, whether it's buying it yourself or with a neighbor. Um, you know, you're not turning all year, so it's, it's probably a machine that, that you can trade with, you know, and trade time and, and labor with. But um, I would recommend getting a machine. Now, 
size wise this is a good way to start but like I said if, if you're wanting to to be the most efficient a wider machine would probably uh, be the best way to go the other mistake I think a lot of guys starting out uh, might make is is thinking they can can get away with just a normal transmission tractor yep. um, you basically have to have a creeper an IVT or a hydro to do a good job because you're when you're starting off with a big windrow no matter whether it's this machine or the other machine I'll show you, you're wanting to go probably less than half a mile an hour and even slower because you're moving a lot of material. And once you start breaking that material down, it does get easier, but you, um, you'd be riding the clutch a lot yes. on, on a tractor. So if I were to start and budget was the biggest thing, a vertical or a horizontal beater manure spreader would be able to do would, would be able to do a pretty good job, especially on a small scale because it starts that process, it starts to heat it up. Um, and then if you have a loader, you can come and turn it later and, and you've got a, a decent product, especially if you're just putting on farm ground. I'm never concerned about what other people think. And, and, and if I was, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Uh, and I, you don't always win. Uh, you probably lose more than you win. But I, I'm always up for a challenge. And this is probably a, a real, real challenge. The thing is, you've got to be committed. And uh, if you're not committed, don't even start because it can be trying. You know, a lot of people say, well, compost isn't worth it or whatever, but I, I, I still think it's got a lot of benefits, uh, you know, to composting. So you just don't think that this can have, but this is Mother Nature working at its finest.